Hey, thanks for joining me today for this episode of Curves Welcome, a podcast about facing and embracing the curves of life. If this is your first time tuning in, this is Susie Carr. Today, I welcome a very special guest to the Curves Welcome podcast, Christian De La Huerta. With 30 years of experience, Christian is a sought-after spiritual teacher, personal transformation coach, and a leading voice in the breathwork community. He has traveled the world offering inspiring and transformational retreats, combining psychological and spiritual teachings with lasting and life-changing effects. An award-winning, critically acclaimed author, he has spoken at numerous universities and conferences on the TEDx stage. His new book, Awakening the Soul of Power, was described by multiple Grammy Award winner Gloria Estefan as a balm for the soul of anyone searching for truth and answers to life's difficult questions. And he has received a Nautilus Book Award and a Nonfiction Book Award. To find out more about his work and receive a free guided meditation, power practices, and a chapter from the book, visit his website at soulfulpower.com. Welcome to the podcast, Christian. It's so nice to have you here on Curves. Welcome. Susie, thanks so much for having me. I've um, been looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. Same here. I have been reading your book and just excited to share that, share parts of what your thoughts are behind your, your work, your brilliant work with the listeners today. So let's just get right into it because there's a lot of questions I have. Let's talk a little bit first about your journey to becoming the author of this powerful book, Awakening the Soul of Power. What brought you to explore this topic? That's a really, really good question uh, because, you know, I was raised in Cuba. I was born and lived there my first 10 years of life. And so I lived in a communist regime for the first 10 years of life. And for, you know, as you know, having a conversation about personal power in a communist, totalitarian, dictatorial environment is kind of ludicrous. There is no such thing as personal power. Um, And and I was also raised in a very, very Catholic family. And with all due respect to that tradition and and all traditions, it's it's also a very hierarchical power structure, powers from above. And there isn't much leeway in terms of what to believe and what not to believe and what's right and what's wrong and all that kind of stuff. and, and I mean, there are many blessings for, for which I'm really grateful of having been lived, of having been raised in a communist country. One of them is that we didn't have it. I mean, we had a TV, but there was nothing worth watching. And so, and I knew that you would appreciate this because I know that you as a young, young uh, girl, like developed this lifelong love affair with books, as did I, because we grew up reading and we grew up inventing our own games. And, and for that, I'm really, really grateful. Um, and so, you know, a couple of things inspired this particular interest in this theme. One of them is my my older sister, you know, who's who's a natural born leader. She you know, she was just I'm one of nine kids, so again, further <laughs> another evidence of that Catholic upbringing. And um, you know, she, when she had puberty, like when she was a kid, like she would boss not only the nine of us around, but the entire neighborhood with like fifteen kids. And in a natural way, it wasn't like a bossy thing. It's like she would just say, hey, let's go do that. And we would all say, okay, let's all do that. And when she hit puberty, something shifted. Like she turned that thing off. And I don't know if somebody says something to her directly or whether she just picked it up from, you know, from, from the culture through osmosis that, that little girls didn't behave that way, that young women didn't behave that way. But she took on this other persona, this kind of Mother Teresa persona. And so that always like, I never really understood that, what happened there. And then flash forward a few years ago, well, probably about 10 years ago now, I had submitted a, a book proposal to an agent that I was working with, a literary agent in New York. And um, it was on a different theme. And she said, yeah, I want to work with you. But before we pitch it to a publisher, I want to see some of your marketing ideas implemented which would have taken me a year to implement those, those marketing ideas. So for me, it was like ee, putting on the brakes, sc- you know, screeching halt because I was already spending that advance in my mind. And suddenly it was like, okay, what do I do now? And it kind of set me into a little bit of a spin for a few days. And then I had this realization. It just hit me like one of those, you know, palm to the forehead kind of moments. 
Because about a month before, sitting in meditation, for only the second time in my life, now it's happened three, but this was only the second time where I'd heard audible words, you know, like words that I could actually hear not inside my head. And, and the words were the soul of power. I was like, huh, what an interesting concept. I never thought of that. Got the URL. I didn't, you know, didn't forgot about it. Didn't think about it again. So now in this crisis of what do I do next? It, that moment of realization was, well, I've been saying for years that the single most important thing that needs to happen in the world is the empowerment of women. And, and not to put women up on a pedestal, not to idealize women. Women are also capable of abusing power. Um, and But it's because, and not to give women more stuff that they have to do and clean up on this planet of ours, but it's, it's because the planet's been running so off kilter, so off balance where it comes to balance between the masculine and the feminine energies. And I believe that when women are in 50% of power in this world, we're going to have a very different relationship to war and poverty and hunger, how we treat the environment, social justice, distribution of wealth, all of it. So, so for me, it's more like a strategic thinking. Like, you know, if we want to hand, what is one thing that we could focus on that then handles everything else or most everything else at least, then that's it. And so then the, the realization was empower, empowerment of women, soulful power. It's like, wow, like that's it. Like, how do we do that? How do we step into power in a way that's not about hierarchy, control, fear, force, domination, manipulation? How do we step into power in a way that doesn't require that we push somebody down, step on them, put our knee to their neck in order for us to feel powerful? And so that began my, my thinking about this. Wow, you said so much that I just like I'm writing down notes because I don't want to forget some of these train of thoughts that are running through my head. First of all, wow, that's such a beautiful everything you just said was really beautiful. And it reminds me of something that I, that I heard in college, one of my college professors, it was a gender study class, and he took he took on the name of his wife instead of his wife taking on his mm. name. And his daughters, the same thing happened with their spouses. They took on the daughter's name instead of the, instead of the daughters taking on their husband's names. And it just, it brought me right back to that classroom of wow. studying gender, gender equality and empowerment. And <laughs> wow, that, talk about a, like a time lapse going backwards and just reliving some of that, those emotions, because I, I remember feeling that was a very powerful and just empathetic and humane way of looking at life is to be able to look through the lens of the fact that human beings, as human beings, we are all uh, stewards of this planet, right? We all yes. have our stake in it. Yes. And we all have value to give to this planet. And the ideas and the just the makeup of our different genders and uh, how we may approach things as human beings, it should be celebrated that diversity the, the diversity of thought and the diversity of how we would approach such changes that the world obviously needs. <laughs> yeah, no, you, that story that you said about your professor and, and the next generation is like, it really touched my heart too, yeah. because it's so subtle, the misogyny, it's so subtle. Um, and, you know, like in the Latin cultures, at least the women get, get to keep their name, but then you add the of, the the husband's name so it's still it's still not okay it's still right. not okay so so i i it's i appreciate that that action of some men to willingly just reverse the system to to have us question um to, by by taking something that just bucks the system and does it a different way Mm -hmm. It's all, it reminds me of the yin and yang and the balance, the balance within the universe. And uh, I love what you said about you were in a med meditation and you heard those words. You actually heard those words, uh, the soul of power. And I've had that experience in meditation myself, where if you really quiet your mind and you listen in and you, for me, it's about listening to my heart, yes. just listening to the beat of my heart and imagining that that it's beating in sync with other things around me in the universe, even my family from 400 miles away. I, can, I imagine that my heart's beating with my parents' heart. And, mm. and that, that meditation, that meditative state of mind, that's where answers come to you. And I find that to be such an invigorating experience. And it's an experience that a lot of times I've gotten out of the habit of doing that. 
And what I love about doing this podcast is I, I, I listen and I learn from people like yourself. And it reminds me that of, of sometimes life gets too busy and unbalanced and we forget the magical parts, these magical moments where just simply breathing and letting your heart rate, heart beat with others in, in sync can really bring you to that place where you find the answers and you find that balance that you seek. Now, I love yeah, that. yeah, it's, I want to speak more about balance because I think that a lot of us struggle with that. But specifically, I really enjoy the idea, the concepts that you brought about, especially in chapter three, desperately seeking balance. And you talk a lot about the the powers and gender. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your ideas and your thoughts on that. Share your thoughts about gender and power and, and the, the balance that we're all seeking. And just, yeah. Yeah. You know, that is so important because it's, you know, like I said, and as we know, the world has been running so off balance. And for the last, you know, several thousand years, you know, I don't know if it's five or six, however long this patriarchal phase of our evolution we've been in where the feminine was made something weakness it was turned into weakness it was turned into something that was less than and 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 so no wonder you know no wonder we treat um our bodies the way that we do no wonder we treat the planet the way that we do and it's just no longer sustainable because that's that's all connected to the feminine um, you know, the, the, the relationship with the body, the relationship with the planet, it, it's all a part of that connection with, with the manifestation of the feminine. Um, and, and it's important for all of us to realize that the whole universe is, has that balance between masculine and feminine, and that they're equally balanced. And that much to the surprise of some human beings, we are also part of the universe. So we're go- governed by the same rules that govern the stars. And so that balance is also in us, that, that we all have masculine and feminine energies. And, and so, you know, just to, to shake a little bit this belief that the feminine is weakness, if you, if you want to talk courage, if you want to talk capacity to deal with challenge and pain, let's talk about the power of creation that resides in the female body. And I'm not going to do this justice because there's, there's nobody like, like Betty White but I read something that she was being interviewed and somebody said something about, um, you know, having balls. And she said, wait just a minute. You know, I don't, I don't know where we get this connection between courage and, and balls because you thump those little things and the guy collapses over in pain. And so you want to talk courage? <laughs> let's talk. You want to talk strength? Let's, t- let's talk vaginas. Those things take a pounding. <laughs> and, and so... You know, it's hilarious, but there is something to that, right? And again, it's not to make the masculine, it's not to knock men, of course not. It's not to make, you know, one better than the other. It's it's a balance that we need, right? We don't want to go back to a matriarchal system. What we need is balance. And, and, and let me say this, because this book is for everybody, uh, because everybody, we all struggle with our relationship to power. You know, we have this ambivalent relationship to power. We want it, but part of us is afraid of it. We can talk about why that is too. But the 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 thing about that is, so it has a particular message for women because I was because of what I was saying before, because of the imbalance of power, and my strategic thinking about women's empowerment. But it's also important to realize that men pay a price for this hierarchical power over system. And so just briefly, just look at a couple of numbers that point to that. The rate of suicide in the U.S. is by, I think, men commit suicide four times as frequently as women. In fact, 70% of the suicides in this country are committed by, committed by middle-aged white men who is still, and that's still the group that holds the majority of the power in the world. So what's up with that? shouldn't they have some kind of built-in advantage because they are the, the main holders of power? And if we look at longevity in the U.S., women outlive men by, by five years. If we look at, the, at those numbers globally by seven years. So there's something that's not working for men either. And I think part of it is because we've got this twisted definition of what it means to be a man. So that's why I added a whole chapter on, on what it means to be a man in, in the 21st century. Because we've got this misunderstanding. And, and so we walk around um, 
you know, like this uncaring, unfeeling robot. Because since we were little boys, we were told, you know, look, you know, little boys don't cry. Why? Because only little girls cry and because that's weakness. It's like, wait a minute, that very premise is messed up. The feminine, as we already talked about, is not weakness. And the emotions are also not weakness. The emotions are neither strength nor weakness. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just energy. That of course, energies that course through our bodies, what used to be spiritual teaching that everything is energy. Now we know from physics. It's true. From quantum physics, we know that everything is energy. That means our bodies, our emotions, it's all energy. We know from physics, energy cannot be destroyed. So just because we stuff emotions, because we've been mistakenly taught to believe that they're weakness. And, and so all of us, this because women do this too, we suppress our emotions. That stuff doesn't go away, right? We can't sweep it under the rug. It stays in, in it gets lodged in the tissues of our bodies. And, and it can only come out one way or another. So we stuff and we stuff and we stuff. And the next unfortunate one comes and rubs us the wrong way or says something to us the wrong way and boom, volcanic eruption. And we cause harm to our relationships. Or we suppress, we suppress, we suppress. That energy has to come out and it starts seeping out and showing up as bodily symptoms, cancer, heart attacks, ulcers. And so we've got to get away. We've got to get a, a handle on our emotions and learn how to express them courageously because yes, it takes courage to, to, to feel and, and, to, and to master how to, how to communicate those emotions responsibly and gracefully. Um, and we also have got to get this relationship with power, right? Because it's, it's, we just don't have the, the, the room to continue the way that we're going anymore. The way you just explained that was so eloquent. The grace that it took to, to say that was really, uh, was beautiful to listen to. Emotions are energy and we are full of energy. And I, I have to say when I, I love looking at life through the lens of an energetic environment, because that for me is what makes me feel connected to a higher purpose and to everything under the sun. It makes me feel like I, I have to, it, it re-energizes my reason for being a steward of the planet, for taking care of the planet as best as I can and, um, and, and, and the people in it. And emotions are so strongly tied to that energy source. And you're right. I, I feel like everything you said about the, the expression of emotions is so important. And I do believe that that right there in and of itself is a power, a self-empowerment that mm. if we could learn to tap into expressing our emotions in a healthy way, then the whole planet would be in a better place. Now, what that effective way is, I think it's different for everybody because we all have different personalities and we all have different energy channels running through our bodies at all given times and we're all affected differently, right? Yes. So I think it's a matter of giving ourselves a break and saying, if I, I have these times where I, I don't even, I, I feel like I just want to cry to release emotions. I'm not sad about anything, but sometimes it just feels like oh, good cry. I, it's hard to explain, but after I do that, I feel cathartic and I can move on yes. because if I don't do that, then I don't know, I start to feel really yucky and I, I don't understand why. And then all of a sudden one day I say, just, let's just, you know, sit here and meditate. And then I, I, I well up with emotions for, I don't even know why, but then they're released and I'm like, oh, I feel so much better now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's, much better that's now. So, that's so good because to realize that sometimes they may not even be our emotions that we're feeling like we live in such an interconnected world and, and so much stuff that is happening in the world that it just is not okay. That is difficult. That is challenging. And sometimes we're tapping into that and we've got to give expression to that because if we don't, there's a price to pay for holding on to those emotions. Yeah, that's so, that's so true. I feel very tied to what happens in the world. Even if I'm not watching the news, I feel, I feel there's a heaviness in the air when there's a heaviness in the air. And it's, it is a matter of being able to realize that, that that's what's happening, is that I think just the awareness that we're so interconnected and people don't even realize they're connected to something bigger yes. and stronger and more perverse than, than they are themselves. So I think that awareness is really key. And I think you can tap into that through meditation. Yes. Um, I really liked what you said, and I'd like to go back to that is, you know, we want power. 
right? We all say, oh yeah, we want, we want power over things, but we're afraid of it. And I totally relate to that. I really do. I, a lot of times it's, it, you know, I don't fear, I don't fear failure so much as I sometimes fear success Yes. because yes. with success, we change. And I'm afraid of what that change is. I mean, I, I've experienced that with writing my books. I remember when I first started publishing my books and they were becoming popular and I was getting followers and people were saying nice things. And if you're not careful with that little, that little small, little bit of, I guess I would call it a little bit of power, then it could really take over your life. And I really do feel like that could change a person for the better or for the worse, depending on how you view it and how, what you, how you deal with that. And if you don't have a strong foundation with your life, with your significant others, with your family, just with your grounding, then it could take you on a wild ride that it could be that I think that's worse sometimes than than failing that success. If you're not primed for that. So let's talk a little bit about that wanting power, but we're afraid of it. Do you have any tips on how we can deal with that dichotomy? Yeah, yeah. And first, let me add something to what you just said about fear of success, because I find that it's not as frequent as fear of failure, but it's definitely common. And and in people in my retreats, that often surfaces. And I think the other layer that that is a factor around that is, is that sense of accountability, that if I really succeed, if I really make it big, if I really go for it, then what? Right? Do I then have to continue showing up? What have what are the impacts on my personal life? Um, which is which I've had to deal with because I'm basically introverted. I'm assuming that you are as well, from having such a, a, a deep, intimate personal life from an early age and your relationship with, with books. Um, and so I didn't want to be in the public eye either. It's like I for me, that was it's only my sense of mission that allows me to, to do what I do and, and be, you know, to accept this, this role of being in the public eye. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, I think that's one of the ways in which we struggle with power. Like if we really bead all of who we are, if we really step into our power fully, I think there's a part of us that fears that other people wouldn't be able to handle us and that we might get rejected and end up alone. There's also a fear, as you know, as I've been doing retreats on this theme, another one that comes up frequently is that people fear that if we really stepped into our power, we might abuse it. We might cause harm with it. And no wonder, like all we got to do on any given day is turn on the news or glance through the, through the headlines online to witness at least one abuse of power. And what good hearted person wants to do that? We don't want to be that way. And then add to that, we've been conditioned that power is bad, that power is a negative thing with quotes like power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. What they didn't, what they didn't tell us about that quote, that, though, is that Lord Acton was speaking specifically about political power, not personal power. And, and so also what good heart a person wants to be corrupted. And so add to that, to that mix, what we were talking about the emotions, and because we've been so conditioned to run away from our emotions, we hate conflict, we fear confrontations. So when you put all that together, what happens is that we end up giving our power away, our innate, inherent, personal power that no one can give to us, no one can take away, we are the only ones who can give it away. And, and the sad part is that we give it away for, for lame reasons. So we end up playing small. We end up saying yes when inside we feel no. We we end up stuffing our our preferences, our beliefs, our our desires for out of fear of of rejection. For so so for like for false sense of security, uh, for false sense of, of, of acceptance and for morsels for crumbs of pseudo love. Because as long as we're presenting ourselves as something that we're not, as as long as we're withholding huge parts of who we are, we're not showing up authentically. So anything we get back from anybody is not fully authentic either. So it's pseudo love what we get back. And so it's not an effective strategy because it doesn't get us what we ultimately want. And so what the theme of this book is, is that there is a way that we can step into our power that 
doesn't have to be abusive, that doesn't have to push anybody down and, and step on them in order for us to feel powerful, that doesn't have to be about fear or control or domination or any of those other things that we were talking about, but that we can step into our power in a way that is congruent, that is a match for, with who we are in, in the innate goodness of our hearts. Mm, wow. Yeah, that, that, that was really deep stuff. And the fearing that conflict not wanting that conflict so deeply resonated with me because that is so who I am. I would, oh, I, I hate conflict. I'd rather be the neutral party and play small sometimes, and I have, yeah. than yeah. actually voice my opinion, even if it's something I strongly feel about. I'd rather just put that on the back burner and allow other people to shine in their thoughts because that conflict of having to I guess, justify my position. And yes, so I struggle with that. I know a lot of people out there struggle with that. And yeah. it is a constant challenge to be able to understand that balance of, of having an opinion of your own, standing firm within your own uh, principles, morals, and being able to, I guess, diplomatically share those views in a way that creates critical thought. Yes. And constructive conversation. And that is something that I, I, I am very committed to, I guess, pursuing that journey. And I, I do that by putting myself in these uncomfortable situations. That's how I have been tackling that. And it does help. It does help to create that, that level of confidence that a person like myself who has struggled with that all her life, wanting other people to shine so that I don't have to, I, I'd rather play small and let somebody else look big than the opposite way. Cause I don't want to, but you know, the goal really should be that balance. So everybody shines and everybody yeah. has a place and, a, and an opinion that is valued and matters. So um, I think remembering yeah. that, keeping that in mind as the goal is that balance versus I'm better than you better than yeah. that, right. That I think that would make everything relationships yeah. and conversations just much yes. more fruitful and health, healthy. Yes, yes. And, and so much of it is about, for me, it's about self-expression because we've, we've been conditioned also to believe that to, that to play as big as we are is arrogance. Yes. Whereas I think it's the other way around, right? Like in these critical times, in this, you could say it's make it or break it times for humanity, the planet will be fine, right? It might take a few million years, but life will continue. In, in some form, consciousness will continue evolving. Maybe it, it, it ends up being a, a, an enlightened cockroach planet. Who knows, right? <laughs> whether, we hey, right? It, <laughs> whether we make it, that's what's up, right? We're now just beginning to witness whatever we have unleashed on the environment. And, and so when I went from that perspective, when it's all hands on deck, right? Anybody who had the slightest suspicion, the slightest inkling, the slightest knowing, that we have work to do as teachers, as healers, as promoters of change, as activists for, for an awakening, for a different way of being. It's like, this is it. And, and we don't have time to play small anymore. Like, like the arrogance is actually playing small. Like that, it's the other way around. When, when, it's, when it's the times require demand that we step into this fully, no, no longer can we do this half-ass. We got to step into this full-ass because that's what's needed and we're all needed. That is what's needed. That is such perspective. It really is a matter of perspective. How you, how you view that arrogance being the playing small part. Oof, love that. <laughs> how, how dare we play small in these times? How dare we? We can't. It's not all right. All it hands is, on deck. All hands on deck. Oh, man. <laughs> One last point that I wanted to talk about with you, with your book, uh, in regards to your book, was the the chapter on happiness. I loved that chapter. It's sometimes it's, it's sometimes hard for people, myself included, to stay in that state of joy. Um, I especially have a hard time when those I care about are not sharing in that state of joy. So. How can we find that balance within that state of happiness when, if you're an empath like me, you take on the emotions of the people that you are around 
And so if I'm around a friend who is always down, maybe justify, justifiably so, it's not for me to judge. There might be reasons I don't understand. How can I best protect myself and stay in that state of joy so that I don't in turn start to feel that negative negativity and put that out into the world? Yeah, and that is such a brilliant and profound question. Hmm. Um, and so two things about it, you know, one is allowing the energies to flow, the emotional energies, so that we don't have to have this expectation that we're always in a state of joy, right? So maybe, maybe because that creates pressure um, and, and life is a flow, right? They're going to be ups and they're going to be downs. There are peaks and valleys and there's parts of life that are genuinely painful, right? Loved ones come and they come and they go. And there's like, we're talking about the trauma, the traumatizing effect of seeing what is happening in the world is like, it's the hum the appropriate response is grief or outrage, right? So, so we give ourselves permission to feel all of those emotions and, and that way we don't get stuck in them, right? So think about, you know, a little kid, like a two-year-old having a full on meltdown. Two minutes later, they're playing like if nothing happened because they had those emotions fully we get into trouble with the emotions because we stuff them. We don't allow ourselves to feel them. And so then we get stuck in them. So, so repressed sadness turns into depression. It congeals into depression. When we repress our anger, it turns into rage. And we walk around like, like cauldrons of rage. It's, and then the slightest thing, just we, we erupt. And so the thing is, it's to become like the little children in, in, in that sense. And not to go around, of course, throwing tantrums. Of course not, but, but to learn as adults to take responsibility for our emotions, right? They're our emotions. Nobody can make us feel anything, right? They're our emotions. And, and so we, we take mastery and responsibility of our emotions and learn not only how to feel and, and identify what we're feeling. Because for me, it was, a, it was a journey 30 years ago. I couldn't tell you what I was feeling because I didn't know. I had no idea what I was feeling. And so it's a journey. And then to learn how to communi communicate those emotions responsibly, courageously, and compassionately and gracefully in a way that the other person can hear it, rather than just dumping them on each other like we end up doing after we suppress them for too long. And so, so that's one part of it, giving ourselves permission to feel the whole gamma, because the other part of that is that we can't suppress emotions selectively. If we suppress sadness, or if we suppress anger, we're also suppressing our ability to feel joy, right? Because we, we suppress them like all at once. And, and so, so that's the, 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 the wisdom and the liberating aspect of allowing yourself to feel all of our emotions. The other important thing that we point to as, as an empath is to learn how to have compassion without taking their emotions on. Right. And, and that's another level of, of mastery in, in relation to the emotions, Let, letting other people have their emotions and, and we don't have to go down in there with them. Right. Because if, if we go right down there with them and then we're rolling in the muck with them, we're stuck in the muck with them. We can't we we, we're, we don't have our perspective. So it's, and it's a balance to find balance between feeling with right compassion and yet not taking them on, because that's what compassion means. Feel with. And, and, and so it's, 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 it's a fine line, you know, between having compassion and yet not taking it on so that we can retain equanimity and balance and so that we can be able to be of service. Because if we're stuck in it with them, then we can't be of service. Absolutely. And so that was really helpful because it reminded me of just the phrase, be kind and like act with love. So, you know, say a, a friend of mine is just deep in a, really bad stuck in the muck type of moment, you can have that compassion. You can be kind to that person, love that person and still give that space because that person, I think sometimes acting out of love is giving that person that space that he or she needs in order to express those emotions. If we're always on top saying, let me help you solve this. Let me help you solve this. Yes, yes. We're actually not doing them service or justice. We're not letting them express their emotions because they yes. feel pressured now, right? Oh, I gotta, I gotta pretend I'm happy now because, you know, Susie's making me feel like I need to feel happy all the time instead of 
right given that space right and and part of it is this conditioning that is so subtle that, that the emotions are bad so it's like we, we walk around our egos walk around like trying to manage not only our and control our own emotional life but everybody else is around us is like hang it up right we need to hang that up like we we're never ever ever going to ha- manage anybody else's emotional life handling our own is a full-time job so let's just focus on ours like master our own, our own emotions and and then we can have the space and hold the space where other people can feel safe having their emotions around us and we don't have you know we don't have to get sucked into that and it's not cold heartedness it's actually deep compassion because of what we were just saying that otherwise we're rolling down in them up, in them up with them so it's sort of like you know I'm in, I'm in south florida these days um, and for us, like s- storms are a reality, like a constant reality. And, and so it's learning how to master that eye of the storm, right? Like we maintain our center, our fullness, our, our equanimity, and then we can allow everybody else's emotional life, their expectations, their demands, all the stuff of life, the drama of, of other people and other and life itself, we can allow it around us, but we don't have to get sucked into it. And that is not arrogance. That is not, I mean, that is not cold heartedness. That is deep compassion because if we get sucked into it, then we then we're stuck, then we're stuck in it too. And we can't be of help to anybody. And 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 part of it, um, Susie, is like it's it's so relevant to the to your podcast. You know, curveballs, like crap is gonna happen in this life. Like if, if that's one thing we know that we can count on is that life is gonna throw curveballs our way. That we can know for sure. But but here's the thing also about how to maintain equanimity is that, and, and related to that being in that eye of the storm, that, that no matter what happened in our past and no matter what happens going forward, so no matter what curveballs life will throw our way, whether it's a global pandemic or who knows what in our personal life, it's gonna happen, right? But we're knowing that no matter what happens, we can always get to choose how we show up in response. That alone is liberating and empowering. And it pops us out of this victim mindset and this, this poor me, was me relationship to life, this helpless relationship to life. So, so once we get to that, they talk about personal empowerment. Once we get to that place of knowing that no matter what happened and no matter what happens going forward, we get to choose how we be in response. That is one of the ultimate leaps in, in self-empowerment and, and freeing ourselves. Christian, I have to tell you that this conversation feels like it's been like a cleanser to my soul. <laughs> I am serious. You've just brought up so many amazing points. And I really want to urge my listeners to go out and get your book because it really is transformative. I'm loving it. It's awakening the soul of power. I will be linking to it in the description of this podcast. And I I really encourage everybody to go out and get a copy because it is transformative. It really is. And this whole conversation has been transformative. Mm. Christian, how can, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? If, if they want to read your book or like, or anything like that, reach out with questions. Yeah, thank you so much for asking that, Susie. And, and thank you for, for having me on the show. And thank you for having the show. As an introvert, I know that you're stretching yourself outside of your comfort zone to do this. And, and your willingness to do that and your courage to do that is making a difference in who knows how many lives um, who might be listening to this or will listen to it at some point. So, so thank you for all of that. Um, in terms of how to reach me, the book is available wherever books are sold, like you know, your local bookstore if you want to support them, or Amazon, um, and all the other online um, retailers where you can get it. Um, in terms of reaching me, probably the best way is my website, and from there they can access my social media, my, and that website is soulfulpower.com. And for your listeners, for your or, or your viewers, who, who who for your audience, who's seeing or listening or, or watching this, um, if they get on my email list, and, and we know how easy it is to click unsubscribe if it doesn't work for you down the road, but just by getting on my email list, they will get a, a sample chapter from the book that talks about what it means to live heroically in the twenty first century, because everything that we're talking about is heroic. It's the stuff of heroes. 
To go through life consciously in the ways that we've been talking about is nothing less than heroic. So they'll get a, a chapter about what that means. They'll get a, a, some power practices that are designed for, so that the teachings, the concepts don't stay at that level of information because we don't need more information. We've got information overload. What we need is the transformation that you were pointing to, right? So it's applying those teachings to our lives that then results in transformation, which is what we want and what we need. And, and then they'll also get a guided meditation on, and, and a teaching on trust, which I, I created intentionally for these times of, of dramatic, dramatic social change and these times of, of chaos and uncertainty. So, so thanks again. Thank you so much, Christian, for, for, for being here. And thank you everyone for tuning into this very special podcast episode on Curves Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, go out there and continue to learn, grow, and embrace life's curves.